We ready? Yes. All right. All right, all. everyone. <laughs> all right, welcome cool. to the second second ever DAV lecture in the history of ever. Uh, today we'll be focusing on combinational and sequential logic, which is kind of the the fundamentals of digital logic programming. So, you know, in the previous lab, there were no fundamentals and we were kind of just asking you to like intuit it off the example designs. So, you know, we're really sorry, but now we'll actually be teaching you like fundamentals. And, uh, you know, before we begin, we have a little game that we'd like to play. Um, just so, you know, if you're actually here, you get to experience this. It's called Where in the World. So I've put a bunch of pictures of places that I've been. And uh, we have this little form that you can fill out. It is right here. It's in the chat. And uh, it will take like two minutes. And, you know, if you guess it, uh, you know, over time, we may or may not give you a prize. Wait, well, how come I can't see so the chat? If you're consistently here for, for all the lectures, and you guess, guess right. Ah. And, uh, you know? OK, and we'll wait for, I think, they're all the same place. They're all the same place. Okay, someone guessed your mom, and I don't appreciate that. You can guess uh, as specific as possible. Continent is also OK. okay. It's, um, you know, try to make a guess with as, uh, as specific as possible. If you're racist, I get this wrong. Don't worry about it, man. It's not personal. All right. Maybe it is in Europe. You never Maybe know. it is in Europe. And, uh, you know, I guess I'll reveal the answer at the end of the recording. And uh, all right, let's get started. All right. All right. Um, so just a few quick announcements. Congrats, congrats everyone on completing your first lab. Uh, you know, as always, this is our first time running this lab. So feel free to give us any feedback if you want. I know a lot of people have already, you know, given us their thoughts and we really appreciate that. Um, if you are trying to get help or get checked off, try to message both of us uh, at the same time, because uh, it just, makes it so that you know you're more likely to get help because if one of us is busy maybe the other person isn't um, and try to come into the lab for checkoffs because what happened was on friday and tuesday uh like a lot of people were messaging us at once and it was like kind of not a good time so uh do try to come into the lab uh, you can just message us to come in and uh if you send screenshots of your waveform, try to zoom in uh, so we can actually see what the signals are doing because you know it's it's not really helpful if like it's just like green blob. Uh, and try to include all the signals as well. Uh, also, you know, for this first lab, yeah, okay, it's the first lab, whatever, but try not to turn your lab super late. And uh, we're not sending you emails anymore because there's too many people. So we're only gonna put everything on Facebook. So make sure you check that. And team formation for winter and spring is also gonna be happening soon. And we'll have more info coming on Facebook. And next, it's, yeah. Uh, it? oh, yeah. Wait, oh, what were you gonna say? Yeah, I was just gonna say, really do try to come to the lab for checkoffs because it just makes it, quicker and easier as well, rather than a spam of messages back and forth. So we'll have our normal lab hours, but also you can just message us to come to the lab as well. Uh, okay, next, GB, general board, very exciting. It's, uh, you know, in case you're not uh, already familiar, it's kind of a 
family style system, like IEEE's version of their family system, where members get to interact with uh, IEEE officers really closely. And it's a great way to you know, meet other members, make friends and learn what the officers do. You get to you know, shadow them pretty closely. And uh, every GB lead kind of decides what they want to do and how they want to run their GB. So it's not focused on socials, projects, just chilling. Um, you know, they'll give advice too. So like EE or CS or internship advice, life advice, terrible advice. You know, my, my GB last year, he gave me cough drops. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, I thought that was a great experience. Um, and, you know, it's a great time. And uh, I really highly encourage uh, doing GB. And the GB intro session is in two weeks. Uh, the events on Facebook already is in the IEEE group, also here. Um, yeah. Finally, idea hacks. Apply for idea hacks, which is on this next slide. It's very cool. This year, obviously, um, we're not inviting you to Akron Grand Ballroom, but we're, we are sending you parts, and you get to just like keep the parts after you like make cool stuff. And uh, you know, application deadline also almost in uh, two weeks. Very pretty design. I agree. The event is also on Facebook at this link. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. If not, uh, we'll be moving on. All right, so here are some tips from the last lab that might make your life easier in the next uh, kind of, uh, like in the next labs. So we have the difference between like assigned statements and reg and like just setting something equal to a value. So assigned statements only work if your data is a wire. And then similarly, or conversely, the values that are changing inside an always block must be registers. You can think about why that is. Um, it's usually because an always block is a trigger. So maybe remember how, what we were talking about with wires and registers. Um, cases are supported in Verilog, so you can do case statements, but not always recommended. And we'll get kind of more onto that later. Um, if your work folder is empty in model sim, um, it's possible that your code is still wrong, even though it compiled. So you can scroll up on the transcript in model sim usually to check for any errors that might uh, have come up. Also, something new for your test benches. The command stop is better than the command finish because it won't ask you to like quit model sim at the end. So it'll just stop at the end and you won't have to accidentally quit your program. Also, the device we are using is a 10M50 DAF484C7G. You can find that on the data sheet. A few people like kind of tr struggle with that, and we understand because Cordis actually they have a little thing that says, "Oh, choose the max debt 10 lightboard," but it's not actually the right code. If you don't choose the right device, it won't be programmable onto your FPGA. So make sure to pick this device specifically. All right, and then a recap on digital logic. So we have digital circuits. That's the entire purpose of this program. And they run on series of ones and zeros. And generally, every kind of circuit is designed based off transistors. And larger circuits uh, kind of determine how your system reacts to ones and zeros. So we have our wires and we have our registers, which we talked about in our last lecture. And then we kind of make these circuits by writing and connecting Verilog modules. So then. As we go on, we're going to be talking about two types of digital logic this, this week. We're talking about combinational logic and sequential logic. And these two logics, when they are put together, they kind of actually make larger programs function. Okay. David, you're muted. First type of logic is combinational. Combinational is generally like simpler and easier. That's why everyone likes. So then, you know, what is combinational logic? It's just based on the values of your inputs. Um, so whatever inputs you have going into your kind of module, uh, you'll get an output. And behind the scenes, this is made of uh, like logic gates and transistors, uh, which you know you have inputs and you get an output voltage, and that output voltage corresponds to you know one or zero if it's high or low. And so you know these are typical logic gates. I'm sure, you know, maybe you've heard of some of these before. Um, and just remember that you only need wires uh, as inputs 
and outputs to your to your logic gates. So here's a little table of the common logic gates in case you need a, a refresher or you want to know what these gates do. There's this little uh, truth table on the side. If you're in a CS M51A right now, I'm sure you know this is your best friend. Um, yeah. Then moving on, uh, there's a few reasons why we use combinational logic. And the first one is the most important. It's because these logic gates are the way we calculate uh, values. And so whenever you do some sort of operation that uh, involves two values, so things like add or subtract, all these things, it, it is a combination, it, there is combinational logic uh, behind it. And um, if you really understand what your combinational logic is doing, uh, it really helps you kind of understand the, the low level um, kind of workings behind your program. Um, and uh, from logic gates, we can kind of build up a little higher into a little, some of these building blocks. So you're kind of like multiplexers or adders, decoders. We had a few of these in the last lecture. Um, if you wanna look back on that and look at their functions. And fundamentally, they are just logic gates uh, kind of strung together in kind of funny, clever ways and they all have a specific purpose. And if you wanna make your own building block, of course you can do that uh, with your own logic gates. Okay, sorry, I was muted. So then there's also sequential logic. So there's a time and place and usually associated with this kind of logic. So we can see some of David's great memes if you can figure out the, the meme on the right, I will applaud you. So our sequential logic is logic that basically depends not only on just the inputs, but also the previous outputs. So we kind of keep track of the state that we were in so that we know what state we should come in, we should uh, change to with a new input. So this requires the use of registers to remember our previous outputs because remember our registers will have memory until a certain trigger happens. And unlike combinational logic, when you um, use Verilog for sequential logic, the instructions that you program are actually executed in a specific order rather than all at once. So, but first registers, you remember we have an input and an output and um, a trigger signal, usually a clock. So when we have um, data present at a certain clock time, it is transferred from D to Q. So pay close attention to the di difference between T1, T2, and T3. So we have that T1 at when the signal rises, the output data becomes high, just like the input data. And same thing for T2. And then in between T2 and T3, you can see the data change, but the output didn't change. Why is that? Because the clock wasn't, the clock wasn't triggered. So then we don't change anything until T3. So as general curiosity, can anyone just type it in the chat, like think about what this circuit might do? Cause this is the type of a sequential type of sequential logic circuit. Oh wait, the chat's not pulling up for me for some reason. Uh, okay, well, David, can you see the chat? Cause I can't see it. All right, Katie had a good intuition. Does it add? Um, you know, I like the sound of that. And Daniel Chen says a counter and Andrew says plus equals operation. Those are all pretty good answers, I think. Yeah, so so that's actually very good. Um, we have on your circuit this kind of weird just general adder and it takes in the input of n which was the output of our previous register and then it actually adds you can see specifically one. So this is basically a plus one circuit a plus one circuit that adds one to n and changes the, the value of n at the positive edge of a clock cycle. So why are we going to use sequential logic? Com combinate, and that's because combinational logic can only do so much. When we add sequential logic, it actually creates another layer of complexity for our hardware to function. And it allows for more complex programming because now we can hold our previous value and 
also be dependent on more than just inputs, which is basically memory. So why can't we just always use sequential logic? Like I told you guys that it, and when you program in Verilog, it'll be more like code that you're used to in C++ that you just program one statement at a time, right? Why can't we just do that? It seems simpler, right? Well, the answer is no, we can't. We can't just use sequential logic. So there are times when we don't want our code to execute sequentially, because if you remember, our circuit is actually, our logic is actually going to be running on a circuit. So we have wires that are important, that don't have timing constraints and they need to run always, they always need to run. So that's why we have sequential logic and combinational logic. So some circuits are less dependent on others and less dependent on timing. Okay, wait, real quick, like, does anyone have like questions about this? Because, you know, like if you've never touched sequential logic before, it's kind of kind of spooky, I think. You know, like I definitely had a lot of trouble in, in M16 while I was doing this. Okay, well, all right, I guess you guys are all smart. I'm proud of you all. All right, and then continue. so going on, yeah, so going on, this is kind of what we get when we combine sequential and combinational logic. So if you actually look, we have our old adder circuit right here, and it actually kind of looks like this. So on a more general sense, we have your combinational block right here on your left, and that is just going to kind of calculate the next input, the next input to our circuit that we should be getting. And then right here is our register, and you can see kind of like this feedback loop. And that kind of denotes your sequential logic, which will tell you when to update your inputs. And so when you combine both of these, you're going to see how your inputs and your outputs change. So this is kind of your count equals count plus one, which is based how we said it's a memory. Circuit. Yeah, real quick. Uh, so the little letters under like in and next state and the output of the combinational logic, uh, Travis is right. Those specify the number of bits. Um, so the number of wires uh, going in. So for example, n could equal you know six, and that means your input to the combinational logic is is six bits. Um, and your right, D is the input to flip flop. Uh, D stands for data, and Q is the output, and Q stands for Q. <laughs> Q stands for Q. Does that make sense, David? I think. Does that make sense? Yes, no. Speak. Yes, it's a D flip flop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So we were talking about uh, sequential logic and the way we usually uh, track or you know design our sequential logic is through state machines. And it's uh, kind of the way we understand uh, you know, how the function is behaving at each kind of step in the process. So each state, so this little in this graphic here, each state is, is the bubble and it describes the purpose of the state. So for example, you know, this, this one is open door. That means, you know, the state represents the open door state and it has, you know, a name and a, like a number assigned to it. So like one, and it also has um, how it's connected to each of the other states. So, for example, you can close uh, the door and it'll leave, it'll exit the state. And if you open the door, it'll enter the state. And um, uh, so those, those arrows represent transitions in between the two states. And usually uh, to, the transition is, you know, some sort of condition, uh, like a posit or something, or a clock or a counter. And uh, usually you have some sort of uh, output uh, associated with each state or transition. So like uh, if the door is open, you know, you might be out, you might output one or if the door is closed, you output zero, something like that. And you can visualize this uh, using a graph just like this. And, uh, um, you know, if another way of thinking about state machines is through like if else statements, 
kind of uh, if you have like a long list of if statements, each each statement is kind of its own state. And you know, once you uh, go into uh, an if, you have a specific output associated to that state. Then. So then um, we yeah yeah. So we've kind of talked about this before. There's common Verilog symbols for combinational logic, and that's like your bitwise operator, bit, bitwise operators, which are used to kind of implement your combinational logic. So you remember in our previous lab, we asked you for like and or not, and you can see those symbols there. And so basically, these will when we do these, we kind of have our assigned statements. So like here, we're going to say that our out some da is assigned to this type of logic. So it's always going to be in and a QA XOR QB. So this will all this logic will always hold true no matter what. And so when we have a change in our input, our up our output kind of updates almost instantaneously because that's kind of part of our instant circuit or logic circuit. And then we have Verilog for sequential logic. So um, for sequential logic, it's more complicated. We have our always blocks, always at and begin end. You might remember those from the last lab. Um, basically, this is how you know you're using sequential logic because always at here, some sensitivity list is what we call it, is what kind of triggers the program to one run, triggers your state changes, triggers anything else. And then you can see begin and end, which is Verilog's version of braces, which is also your kind of uh, how, how you know you're in sequential logic code because then you're going to be running uh, in instructions one at a time. Um, yeah. And then anytime you're inside of here, you can use like if else statements to check your states and run your sequential logic. So now there's something that you guys have, some of you have brought up in the past um, with our last lab and some Verilog has this kind of weird equals and then there's this like less than equals. So what, pe what people have found out and about this and they're kind of confused about it, it's kind of a confusing topic, but we're about to talk about it now. So there's blocking and there's non-blocking. So blocking assignments is like an assignment statement or an updating statement that prevents other lines, lines of code from running until the current line is finished. Whereas for non-blocking, it doesn't do such a thing. So it will actually kind of run all at the same time if you use non-blocking statements. So another question for the audience is like, what's the difference between this thing on the left and this thing on the right? What, what would be the difference between these two codes? Again, I can't see, I don't think I can see the chat right now. So if anyone has any ideas, you can shout it out. Wait, are we talking about just the left one right now or the right one, both? Just like what makes what makes them different? Okay, so Nathan suggests that setting Y and Z happen at the same time in the second one. What is, yes, that, what do you think that about is that? true. Uh, you know, someone that, that is... elaborate, you know, maybe what the, like what impact does that have, you know? Why does that matter? Why do I, why do we care? Why, why do we have this slide at all? <laughs> okay, doesn't that break it? Oh my goodness. Timing in our circuit, why doesn't get assigned before Z? Yeah, the second one is non-blocking and the first one is blocking. Um, yeah, so why doesn't get assigned before Z? Yeah, so you, you guys are kind of, uh, okay, and Z depends on why. That's like pretty key point. You, know? so you guys are all kind of getting uh, at the idea where, you know, sometimes it actually matters what order uh, you assign things in. You know, I'm sure like everyone has, if you've taken like CS3132, like you've run into a problem where like, you know, you assign things in the wrong order and then now like you don't have a variable anymore, you know? Yeah, so if you just take a look at this, these first if statements between the left and the right. So if you do, if you run this if statement, right, y will become x and then z will become y. 
So essentially Z will become X, right? Since you've already assigned Y to X anyways. So I could have basically said, in some sense, I could have said Z equals X. But in this case, let's say Y is one and X is zero and Z can be whatever. I will assign Y to become zero, but Z will actually become one because the old value of what it does this at the same time. So it'll actually get the old value of Y, not a new updated value of Y from X. So that's kind of one of the key differences. And that's kind of like what something you should pay attention to in your circuits in the future. So non-blocking versus blocking assignments, when should we use them? Uh, this is mainly more of a concern in sequential logic and you use non-blocking when you want to update all values at the same time, kind of. Um, it's best to use non-blocking when you use sequential logic and or, or even if you want to use some sort of logic in a sequential nature, you might, if you want to use like, if you want to assign things one at a time, you're going to want to use blocking. Um, it's typically best for making uh, like multiplexers if you want to use, wait, what am I saying? Yeah, so <laughs> if you look at this bottom right circuit here, you can see how the difference between a blocking and a non-blocking assignment kind of is different. And you can see how they kind of translate to different flip-flops. OK, any questions? Blocking, non-blocking, sequential logic, why does this matter? Why is this happening? Anything? Uh, OK, well, then suppose you have two non-blocking, a blocking, then two more non-blocking. What is the order of execution? That's a very good question. The answer is you can't. When, you're right, when you write Verilog and you have blocking assignments and you have non-blocking assignments, um, they cannot be the same in your always block, they, or they have to be the same in your always blocks. So you can't just do A equals B and then B non-blocking A. You have to do, all. You, it's either all or none. Basically. You have to split them up into separate always blocks? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so if you're trying to run code that has non-blocking statements and blocking statements, you're probably, you're not going to do well because Verilog will not synthesize your code if you have both types in the same always block. Yes. So, you know, luckily you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about mixing uh, blocking types because you can't. Very cool. And then, um, all right, any, anything else while we're on this topic? Okay. If you think of anything, you know, just get it out there. It's like um never mind. That's a bad analogy to me. Okay. Does that only apply for always blocks or the whole module? Andrew, can you explain the question a little bit? So if you do a uh, blocking but on like what what the, uh, Albert put in the chat? But then you put in an always block, that wouldn't work. But if you like put half of it in an always block and then put one like on the in a different always block, would that would that be different? Can you specify? Yeah, what you so mean it would be different. That? All right. I think Brandon gets it, I so think, he can go. <laughs> I think I kind of understand. So you can have yes, you if you have two separate always blocks and one is non-blocking and one is blocking, it will work what you're actually going to find is that you're going to basically make always blocks based on one kind of circuit logic at a time. So you're kind, you can kind of think of it like, I want to design this thing in the bottom right specifically. So I know because of what I'm going to do, I should do a non-blocking statement. And then similarly, uh -huh. then in your other always block, you're going to, you're going to tell yourself, Hey, I know that my code should do something like this. So this is what I'm going to design. I is see. So you're at, so you'll kind of know whether to use blocking or non-blocking dependent because the always blocks are going to be designing a specific circuit that you want, kind of. 
All right, that does make sense. Thank you. And if you don't know, you can message us. <laughs> um, all right. Any other All questions? right, if anyone has any questions, you know, just don't hesitate to pop off. Meanwhile, I'll uh, explain the lab, I guess. So the spec is going to be posted soon in the Facebook group. Lab is due probably next week or next next week. I think it's uh, That's, the I, I think this, this, yes, this is actually wrong. This, this is Monday. It's not due next week. It's Monday of week seven. So kind of at the beginning of next next week. Yeah, I just changed the slide. And then, yeah, you know, it. you're going to be writing everything, which is, you know, fun, cool. And it's going to focus on sequential and combinational logic circuits, which is what we just talked about. And if you need help, please ask us, you know, it's, you know, just don't, don't like struggle on your own. That's it's kind of sad and lonely. Also, don't wait until the last minute because what happens is you wait until the last minute and you can't figure it out. And then like 10 people message us at once and I'm just trying to study for a midterm, bro. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're gonna have work hours for this lab as well, which we're gonna post in the Facebook group. Okay. Oh, also I'm gonna reveal, you know, where it was. Uh, it, it was Taiwan, a couple people uh, answered that correctly. Good for you. Pat yourself on the back. Was not Europe, unfortunately. Um, you know, coincidentally, why was I? Why was I in Taiwan? I, you know, I, I happen to be Taiwanese. You know, these things just happen. Um, but yeah, Taiwan number one. Yeah, that's that's right. Okay, if anyone has any questions about this, speak now or don't, you know, just ask us later. You can ask us in Facebook, Discord. Um, yeah, anything else to add, Randon? Uh, yeah, and if you have questions, if you start early so that you know what your questions are, don't like kind of start late and start the lab late and then kind of develop your questions about two hours before the deadline because we, you know, it's best to ask your questions, get them out early, and then we'll try to explain it to you. And then maybe you'll be able to figure it out a little quicker or at least with a little less stress. Yeah. So definitely start the lab earlier than you, earlier than last minute. Yes. Okay. Okay, that is it for the content of the lecture. So I guess we'll stop for